Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 15 of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto. Day 15 of our seminar on the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, and we're in chapter 6, we've just started chapter 6 uh, of the third canto, and let us begin with our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Niravishesha Shunyavadi Pascitya Deshatarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityananda Sri Advaita Gadad Hashivasani Gauravakta Rinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchakalpa Charupyas Chakripa Sindhubya Evacha. Paditanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnava Ebyo Namo Namaha. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, right, devotees, we just begun the sixth chapter of the Third canto, chapters entitled Creation of the Universal Form. And we have, have begun the first section. The first section is from verse 1 to verse 10, and it's called Maitreya Continues His Instructions. And we are going to begin with verse 3. Here we go. Thus, when the personality of Godhead entered into the elements by his energy, all the living entities were enlivened into different activities. Just as one is engaged in his work after awakening from sleep. Okay, so let's get into the purport here. Prabhupada makes... Interesting point that after the dissolution of the creation, each soul remains unconscious and, and then enters into the Lord along with his, the Lord's material energy. So, of course, these living entities who enter into the Lord, <coughs> they're all conditioned souls, of course, but, but every creation <coughs> gives them a chance to be delivered by Vedic wisdom, to understand their relationship uh, with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, <coughs> how they can engage in that relationship and this way become delivered. So by properly studying the Vedic knowledge, uh, one gets the conviction to take to devotional service and then becomes promoted to the spiritual world. But otherwise, just as conditioned souls, uh, when they when the creation happens again, there's the dis dissolution, then a period of cosmic time after the dissolution and before the next creation. But when the next creation does begin, then the conditioned souls uh, engage in activities according to their previous unfinished desires, their material desires. Basically, the principle is just the same as um, in between lifetimes, uh, during the, the period when the creation is existing. It's just that here there's this gap from the dissolution, previous dissolution, to the next creation. Otherwise, the principle is the same, that according to one's previous desires, one gets a new body, and then one just carries on. But generally speaking, Prabhupada makes 
the point generally speaking. After each body, they forget everything. But the Lord is kind enough to remind them so that they can carry on. Not that he reminds them and then they remember <laughs> everything they did in the past or some of the things they did in the past. Generally, they don't remember anything. Um, but then they do, what they do is they begin to act according to their past unfinished desires, but in the next life. So Prabhupada concludes this paragraph by saying, this unseen guidance is described as fate, and a sensible man can understand that this continues his material bondage in the three modes of nature. So that's the first paragraph. Second paragraph, um, Prabhupada makes the point that some less intelligent philosophers think that that unconscious state, that sleeping state, after the dissolution is the final stage of life. But of course it's not. It's just the living entity remains unconscious. Uh, well, well, Prabhupada explains, actually, it's interesting. After the dissolution of, of the material body, you know, typically after death, uh, during the, the period of when the creation is manifest, so when, this, when, when this, the current body dies, then the living entity remains unconscious, Prabhupada says, for only a few months. But after the dissolution, the total dissolution of the material creation, then he remains unconscious for many millions of years. But still, with the next creation, he is awakened again to continue the previous work. He's awakened by the Lord. So, the living entity, of course, is eternal, and the, the wakeful state, the state of being conscious, um, uh, which, which is manifest by activities, this is his natural condition. When he's awake in the wakeful state, he can't stop acting, and he acts according to his previous desires. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, when his desires are trained in the transcendental service of the Lord, his life becomes perfect and he's promoted to the spiritual sky to enjoy eternal awakened life. Verse 4. When the 23 principal elements were set in action by the will of the Supreme, the gigantic universal form or the Vishvaru body of the Lord came into existence. And we did mention yesterday how we've already had some discussion on the Virat Rupa, the Vishvarupa, the universal form, and, you know, it's been important, it's been interesting. So now we're getting more. So in the purport here, Srila Prabhupada makes the point, the universal form is much appreciated by the impersonalists, but it's not eternal. It's manifest by the Supreme, by the will of the Lord, after the ingredients of the material creation are manifested. And, and Prabhupada makes the point that Krishna showed Arjuna the same form, just to convince the impersonalists that he, Krishna, is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Krishna, Prabhupada makes an interesting point, he puts it in an interesting way, Krishna exhibited the universal form. It's not that the universal form exhibited him. Yeah. So therefore, the, 
Virat, Rupa, universal form, it is not an eternal form of the Lord uh, exhibited in the spiritual world. It's a material manifestation of the Lord. And uh, Prabhupada makes the point that the Archa Vigraha, the, the deity in the temple, is a similar type of form specifically or particularly for the neophytes. But uh, in spite of their, well, Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, in spite of their material touch, such forms of the Lord as the Virat and Archa are all non-different from his eternal form as Lord Krishna. So verse 5, as the Lord in his plenary portion entered into the elements of the universal creation, they transformed into the gigantic form in which all the planetary systems and all movable and immovable creations rest. So the purport the elements of the cosmic creation, of course, they're all, they're all matter. And they have no potency to increase in volume, in size, unless the Lord enters. So the, the, the purport of that, the meaning of that is that matter doesn't increase or decrease unless it's spiritually touched. It's a product of spirit and increases only by the touch of spirit. So therefore the cosmic manifestation has not assumed its gigantic form by itself as unintelligent people may think. Um, so, but the, the end, well, anyway, uh, an important point is as long as spirit is in matter, matter can increase. But without spirit, matter stops increasing. So, for example, as long as the soul's in the body, the body in increases to whatever is the distant size. But a dead body doesn't increase in size. You can leave it for 10 years. You, you leave a child for 10 years, their body gets bigger. You leave a dead body for 10 years, it doesn't increase in size. Actually, it starts decomposing, I'm afraid. So, therefore, the entire cosmic body is increased by the same process that our little bodies increase. So, um, one, one should not... However, foolishly think that the individual, individual infinitesimal soul is the cause of the gigantic manifestation of the universal form. It's not. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the universal form is called the Virat Rupa because the Supreme Lord is within it in his plenary portion. <clears throat> so, okay, verse 6. The gigantic Virat Purusha, known as Hiran Maya, lived for 1,000 celestial years on the water of the universe, and all the living entities lay with him. All right, so the purport... After Gabadakshai Vishnu entered each universe, then half of the universe filled with water and half, of course, is, is not filled with water. But after Gabadakshai Vishnu enters the universe, but before the manifestation, the creation, 
takes place, there's a period of a thousand celestial years. Hmm, okay. But at the time, at the time uh, of the appearance of Gabadakshai Vishnu, all the living entities in the Mahatattva are divided between all the different universes. And they lie down with Gabadakshai Vishnu until Brahma is born. And then Brahma is born and then by his work all the demigods come from him and, and living creatures and so on and so forth. They all come from Brahma. Then Manu, Prabhupada, well Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, Manu is the original father of mankind and therefore in Sanskrit mankind is called Manushya. Humanity in different bodily qualities is distributed throughout the various planetary systems. So Manu, I mean Prabhupada, Prabhupada here towards the end of the purport talks about how Brahma is the first living creature from him come other demigods and, and living creatures. Then Prabhupada just mentions Manu. So he's one of the of the demigods who comes from Lord Brahma and he's the original father of humanity. Okay, so now on to let me just read the last sentence here again of the purport of verse 6. Manu is the original father of mankind and therefore in Sanskrit mankind is called Manushya. Humanity in different bodily qualities is distributed throughout the various planetary systems. And verse 7. The total energy of the Mahatattva in the form of the gigantic Virat Rupa divided himself by himself into the consciousness of the living entities, the life of activity and self-identification, which is subdivided into one, ten and three respectively. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? So there's a a purport here, fairly substantial purport, Srila Prabhupada gives and Prabhupada begins by pointing out, of course, well-known point, consciousness is the sign of the living entity or the soul. His existence, the existence of the soul is manifest in the form of consciousness which in this context is called Jnana Shakti, the potency of knowledge. But the total consciousness is that of the universal form, the gigantic Virat Rupa. And the same consciousness is exhibited in individual persons, just in very small quantities but still it's the same consciousness. The, and then interesting point, very interesting. The activity of consciousness is performed through the air of life, which has 10 divisions. Um, just bear in mind that the verse at the end of the verse, it said that <coughs> the, uh, the, Consciousness or the self-identification is subdivided into one, ten, and three. So these are the ten divisions of consciousness. Prana, apana, udana, vyana, samana, naga, kurama, krikara, devadatta, and dananjaya. Prabhupada continues that the consciousness of the soul 
becomes polluted by the material atmosphere. And so the activities of the soul are exhibited in false ego, material bodily identification. And these activities are described in Bhagavad Gita chapter 2 verse 41. This is the, the last part of that verse. Bahu shaka hyanantas cha buddhayo vyavisayanam that, that when a person is in material consciousness, then their intelligence is bahushaka, mini-branched. So, of course, here we are trying to, uh, to focus our consciousness in the right way. Because at the beginning of the same verse, 241, Lord Krishna says that the devotees, those who are on the path of Krishna consciousness, um, are focused, focused, yeah. One focus, that is Krishna consciousness. So, but anyway, in the conditioned state, the conditioned soul is bewildered into various activities for want of a pure consciousness. If he was in, a, in pure consciousness, he'd be focused on the one activity of pure devotional service. But, but now he's in that splayed out state. And so he has many interests on the material level. And that's, yeah, that's material life. But otherwise, Prabhupada says, in pure consciousness, the activity is one. It means pure devotional service. And Prabhupada concludes, I mean, uh, yeah, concludes the paragraph by saying, the consciousness of the individual soul becomes one with the supreme consciousness when there's complete synthesis, synthesis between the two. So anyway, on to the second paragraph. The monist, the impersonalist, thinks there's only one consciousness. But the devotees, Prabhupada says, it's an interesting point, it's a little subtle. The sattvatas or the devotees, they believe that although there's undoubtedly one consciousness, that means Krishna consciousness, uh, they are one because there's agreement between many, yeah. They're one because there's agree agreement between the many in terms of the one, or the Lord, the Lord's consciousness. Yeah, they're one because there's agreement. So therefore, Prabhupada makes the point that the individual consciousness is advised to dovetail with the Supreme Consciousness. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 1866, Saravadharma Parichyaja Maam Ekam Sharanam Vraja. I think we all know that verse very well. Just give up all varieties of Dharma and just take shelter in me, Maam Ekam, only. So if the individual consciousness does, does this, he'll maintain um, purity, conscious purity. So, but it's certainly foolish to stop activities of consciousness. But they can be purified when dovetailed with the Supreme. Can't stop uh, consciousness, the activities of consciousness, which otherwise are just splayed out in the material world in different ways and focused on so many different things. If we dovetail with the one Supreme Consciousness, then our, we can maintain our purity of consciousness. So, 
Prabhupada makes the point this consciousness is divided into three modes of self-identification according to the proportion of purity. Anyway, those three modes of self-identification, of course, as we've heard before, adiatmic, self-identification with the body and mind, adibotic, self-identification with the material products, and adidaivic, self-identification as a servant of the Lord. So, of these three, Prabhupada says, he concludes the purport by saying that of the three, adidaivic self-identification is the beginning of purity of consciousness in pursuance of the desire of the Lord. Yeah, so adidaivic means, well, as translated, as Prabhupada's presented it here, Adidaivic means self-identification as a servant of the Lord. Yeah, that's a very important point to understand. Okay, verse 8. The gigantic universal form of the Supreme Lord is the first incarnation and plenary portion of the Supersoul. He is the self of an unlimited number of living entities and in him rests the aggregate creation which thus flourishes. So the Supreme Lord, though, Prabhupada says, expands in two ways. His personal expansions, Vishnu, Tattva, different forms of the Lord himself, and then his separated, minute expansions, that's us. Vishnu Tattva and Jiva Tattva. So since we, the living entities, are very small, sometimes we're described as the marginal energy. Like on the beach, there's a margin between the high tide and the low tide. And at the high tide, uh, the margin is covered. At the low tide, the margin becomes uncovered. And the tide goes in and out, and the margins being covered and then uncovered. So, anyway, but the mystic yogis consider the living entities and the supersoul, the Paramatma, to be one. Yeah, one and the same. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, it is, however, a minor point of controversy. After all, everything created rests on the gigantic virat, or universal form, of the Lord. Verse 9. The gigantic universal form is re represented by 3, 10, and 1. In the sense that he is the body and the mind and the senses. That's three, body, mind, senses. He's the dynamic force for all movements by ten kinds of life energy. We, we read that in the purport just some minutes ago, beginning with prana, then apana, and so on. And he is the one heart where life energy is generated. Yes. Okay, so, first paragraph, Prabhupada refers to, he doesn't quote, but he refers to Bhagavad Gita chapter 7, verses 4 and 5, in which it's stated that, the, that eight material elements are products of the Lord's inferior energy. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego. That's eight material elements. Products of the Lord's inferior energy. Whereas the living entity, the jivas, that's us, originally belonged to the 
superior energy, the internal potency. Although we have marginal tendencies, but just like the Lord is Satchitananda, we are no less Satchitananda in our small ways. We're as Satchitananda as him, but in our very small ways. So the eight, those eight inferior energies, earth, water, fire, etc., they work grossly and subtly, uh, whereas the superior energy works as a central generating force. That's the soul in the body, the central generating force. And this is experienced in the human body. The gross elements, earth, etc., form external gross, the external gross body and like a coat, which is like a coat. Whereas the subtle mind, etc., act like inner clothing. Yeah. The, these bodies are external. Here, here's my body. <laughs> but, so it's like a coat over the soul. Whereas the subtle body, well, you cannot see it. Can you? Because it's inside. It's like inner, inner clothing of the body. Like I have on, oh, you can't see it, a t-shirt under my kurta, which is under my jacket here. But underneath it all is the t-shirt. It's the inner clothing. Anyway, so second paragraph, the, the movements of the body are first generated from the heart. The Let me just read that again. The movements of the body are first generated from the heart, from the person and their inspirations, how they want to act. And then activities are made possible by the senses, powered by the ten types of ears that we read about. <laughs> so now Prabhupada, though, what he does now, he's already mentioned the ten types of ears, but just by name, not detailing them at all. Now he's going to explain in more detail. So the ten types of ears, the main ear passing through the nose and breathing is called prana. Yes, there you go, that's prana. The air which passes through the rectum as evacuated bodily air is called apana. The air which adjusts the foodstuff within the stomach and which sometimes sounds as belching is called samana. Sure, how's this? That's really quite something. The air which passes through the throat and the stoppage of which constitutes suffocation is called the udana ear. And the total air which circulates throughout the entire body is called the viana ear. So that's five, the first five of the ten. But subtler than these five are uh, these other ears which Prabhupada describes now. That which facilitates the opening of the eyes and mouth, etc., is called the Naga ear. Wow, look at that, Hare Krishna. That's the Naga ear for you. The ear which increases appetite is called Krikara ear. The ear which helps contraction is called Kurma ear. The ear which helps re relaxation by opening the mouth wide in yawning is called Devadatta ear. 
Oh, Krishna. Okay, that was Deva Dutta here. And the air which helps sustenance, sustenance, is called the Dhananjaya air. Okay. So, now there's a substantial purport here. We go on to the second paragraph. So, Prabhupada explains that all these airs, all these airs, um, are first generated from the heart, which of course is one. Uh, so this central air, the central air, is, is the superior energy of the Lord, who is seated within the heart, with the soul, the soul which is acting under the guidance of the Lord. And Prabhupada explains how the, the, uh, the soul is acting under the guidance of the Lord. In, verse, in Bhagavad Gita chapter 15, verse 15. So, therefore, anyway, we're familiar with that. The verse is cited there in Sanskrit, and basically the translation is, Krishna is saying, I'm situated in everyone's heart, and from me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. By all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the compiler of Vedanta, and I am the knower of the Vedas. So anyway, one way or another, devotees, one way or another, the complete central force is generated from the heart by the Lord who is there and who helps the conditioned soul remember and forget. So the conditioned soul, due to the, the conditioned state, the conditioned state is uh, due to the soul's forgetfulness of his eternal relationship with the Lord as a subordinate. So Prabhupada makes the interesting point, I've mentioned it before, that one who wants to continue to forget him is helped by him because he is giving knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So he'll give you forgetfulness, particularly if you want it. The conditioned soul is thinking, I, don't, I want to think about enjoyment in the material world. I don't want to think about Krishna. So Krishna says, fine. And he covers, well, not fine, but Krishna says, all right. And he covers the knowledge of the conditioned soul. So then the, the soul forgets. Birth after birth, every birth thinking, I'm this person, I'm that person. I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm from this country, I'm from that country, etc. All these things that uh, the Lord helps him to forget himself, but to remember and think about all the different illusory things in material life. So then, Purport continues that, but one who remembers him by dint of association with a devotee is helped to remember him. So we need the association of devotees. That will remind us, even if we're not doing well uh, in Krishna consciousness, what to speak of if we are doing well in Krishna consciousness, then the association of devotees will have very powerful effect. And in this way, the conditioned soul can go back to Godhead. So, uh, Prabhupada, then we, we move on to the fourth paragraph. It really is an extensive purport. And here's an interesting thing. The process of transcendental help, 
by the Lord. We've just been talking about how he helps us to forget or remember him. So the process of transcendental help by the Lord is described in Bhagavad Gita chapter 10 verse 10. I'm sure you all know that verse. Anyway, if you don't, it's written here in the purport. Tesham sadati yuktanam bhajatam priti purvakam didami buddhi yogam tam yena mamupiyanti te. So Prabhupada explains that the buddhi yoga process of self realization with intelligence transcendental to the mind, devotional service. So, yeah, so Prabhupada explains the verse that the buddhi, buddhi yoga process of self-realization with intelligence transcendental to the mind, devotional service, can alone elevate one from the conditioned state. Yeah. The conditioned state, Prabhupada goes on, the conditioned state is like that of a person who is in the depths of some huge mechanical arrangement. Yeah, buddhi yoga, buddhi yoga. So um, the speculators, they, they can reach the point of buddhi yoga, but only after many lifetimes. But an intelligent person who begins from the platform of intelligence above the mind, makes rapid, rapid progress in self-realization. So, and as we see in, in chapter 2 verse 40 of Bhagavad Gita, because buddhi yoga entails no fear of deterioration or regression. It is a guaranteed path to self-realization. Chapter 2, verse 40 of Bhagavad Gita, Neha Bikramanasho Sti Prachavaya Navijate, Swalpam Apyasya Dharmasya Trayate Mahato Bayat. That, yes, um, in, in this path, there's no loss or diminution, and just a little advancement in this path can protect one from the greatest type of fear. No loss, no diminution, as Prabhupada says in the purport here, no fear of deterioration or retrogression. So, the example is given, well, Prabhupada says the mental speculators can't understand the Shvetashvata Upanishad's example of the two birds in the tree, the soul and the super soul. The soul is trying to enjoy the tree eating the fruit, but the super soul just observes. That's our position within these bodies, in, in the tree of the body. So the super soul, the witnessing bird without attachment, helps the fruit-eating bird um, to perform fruit of activities. And anyone, Prabhupada says, anyone who can't understand this difference between the soul and the super soul, or God and the living entities, or the two birds, is still entangled in the cosmic machinery and thus must still await the time when he'll be free from bondage. All right, so we go on now to verse 10. There's some major, pretty or pretty substantial purports around here. So verse 10, the Supreme Lord is the super soul of all the demigods entrusted with the task of constructing the cosmic manifestation. Being thus prayed to by the demigods, he thought to himself and thus manifested the gigantic form for their understanding. Okay. 
So Prabhupada makes the point, the impersonalists are captivated by the universal form. Um, they think that the control behind it, behind the universal form, is an imagination. Wow. But intelligent people can estimate the value of the cause by observing the wonders of the effects. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it? And in, but intelligent people can estimate the value of the cause by observing the wonders of the effects. And for example, the body doesn't develop independently from the mother's womb, but within the mother's womb or at any time, but because, but because the living entity, the soul, is there. Without the living entity, a body, even a body within the mother's womb, if there's no soul, somehow or other, you know, if the, the soul leaves the body of the child who's in the, like in the fetus stage within the womb of the mother, then the, uh, the, uh, the body is not going to develop further, that fetus size body, and it'll just be a stillborn body. So when any material, uh, when any material object displays development, it must be understood that there's a soul there. And Prabhupada talks of the universe, it has developed gradually like the body of a child. So therefore the conception that the transcendence, the transcendental supreme personality of Godhead, yeah, that the transcendence has entered the universe is logical. So as a materialist can't find the soul or super soul in the heart, similarly for want of knowledge, they can't see that the supreme soul is the cause of the universe. Prabhupada concludes the paragraph by saying, the Lord is therefore described in the Vedic language as avan manasa gochara, or beyond the conception of words and minds. So we go on to the second paragraph of verse 10, and this is now the end of this first section. So anyway, the speculators, mental speculators, due to having a poor fund of knowledge, they try to bring the Supreme, Prabhupada says, within the purview of words and minds. So, like, control him with their words, control him with their minds. But the Lord refuses to be so intelligible. You can't just manipulate him with words or mind. So, therefore, the speculator has no sufficient words or his mind is not sufficient to really gauge the Lord's infinity. That's, you know, like the dimensions of the Lord. They're beyond the capacity of anyone actually, but particularly the speculators to uh, sort of, what would you say, define the, the limits of or the extent of the extent of the Lord's infinity. So therefore he's called Adhoksaja, the person who's beyond perception by the blunt, limited potency of the senses. Then Prabhupada talks about PhDs. They're the most intelligent people around on the material level at least on this planet. So the mundane PhDs are completely unable 
to speculate on the Supreme with their limited senses, I mean, to adequately speculate and like really get a, a grip, a clear picture on the Supreme. And this is like the frog in the well. We all know that example. Prabhupada actually explains it in the purport here again. Frog in the well, his friend, another fo frog, arrives one day and says, you know what, I saw the Pacific Ocean and it's massive. It's just so incredibly big. It's just unbelievable. And the frog says, oh, is it as big as my well? <laughs> and the other frog, uh, the frog who saw the ocean says, yes, much bigger. And then the frog, Dr. Frog, Prabhupada calls him, Dr. Frog, PhD Frog. He blows up his chest and says, is it this big? Much bigger. And he blows it up more. Is it this big? Much bigger. And he blows it up further and he expl explodes. Prabhupada says, ultimately, Dr. Frog burst and died. And so Prabhupada, he says, this PhD can also be interpreted as plow department, a, a title meant for the tillers in the paddy field. In other words, it's just so they can make a living. That's all. By plowing. That's all the plowing's about, how to make a living. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying that, I mean, I'm paraphrasing actually, the attempt of the tillers to understand the cosmic manifestation and the cause behind it can be compared to the endeavor of the frog in the well, the endeavor the frog is making to understand the extent uh, calculate the size of the position, Pacific Ocean and actually there's just a tiny little third paragraph that the Lord reveals himself only to a person who's submissive and who engages in his transcendental loving service. Only the devotees can understand the Lord or does the Lord reveal himself to? So, so therefore the demigods who are controlling different, all the different aspects of universal affairs, they prayed to the Lord for guidance. Thus he manifested his gigantic universal form as he did at the request of Arjuna. Okay. So now, next section, two, is Maitreya explains how the Lord took the forms of the demigods. <clears throat> it's from verse 11 to verse 25. And devotees, oops, I'm going to, you know, we're just about at the end of our time. But I am going to read these verses, 11 to 25. Maitreya said, You may now hear from me how the Supreme Lord separated himself <clears throat> into the diverse forms of the demigods after the manifestation of the gigantic universal form. 12. Agni, or heat, separated from his mouth, and all the directors of material affairs entered into it in their respective positions. Okay. By that energy, the living entity expresses himself in words. 13. Actually, there's just a whole series of verses now with no purports. Just the, the description of the, the manifestation of the universal form. When the palette of the gigantic form was separately manifested, Varuna, the director of water in the planetary systems, entered therein. And thus the living entity has the facility to taste everything with his tongue. 
14. When the Lord's two nostrils separately manifested themselves, the dual Ashvini Kumars entered them in their proper positions, and because of this, the living entities can smell the aromas of everything. 15. Thereafter, the two eyes of the gigantic form of the Lord were separately manifested. The sun, the director of light, entered them with the partial representation of eyesight, and thus the living entities can have vision of forms. 16. When there was a manifestation of skin separated from the gigantic form, Anila, the deity directing the wind, the wind entered with partial touch, and thus the living entities can realize tactile knowledge or can understand certain things by touching them. When the ears of the gigantic form became manifested, all the controlling deities of the, of the directions entered into them with the hearing principles by which all the living entities hear and take advantage of sound. 18. When there was a separate manifestation of the skin, the controlling deities of sensations and their different parts entered into it, and thus the living entities feel itching and happiness due to touch. 19. When the genitals of the gigantic form separately became manifest, then Prajapati, the original living creature, entered into them with his partial semen, and thus the living entities can enjoy sex pleasure. 20. The evacuating channel separately became manifest, and the director named Mitra entered into it with partial organs of evacuation. Thus the living entities are able to pass stool and urine. Thereafter, when the hands of the gigantic form separately became manifested, Indra, the ruler of the heavenly planets, entered into them, and thus the living entity is able to transact business for his livelihood. 22. Thereafter the legs of the gigantic form separately became manifest, and the demigod named Vishnu, not the, the personality of Godhead, entered with partial movement. This helps the living entity move to his destination. 23. When the intelligence of the gigantic form separately became manifest, Brahma, the lord of the Vedas, entered into it with the partial power of understanding, <coughs> and thus an object of understanding is experienced by the living entities. 24. After that, the heart of the gigantic form separately manifested itself, and into it entered the moon demigod with partial mental activity. Thus the living entity can conduct his mental speculations. 25. It's the last verse in this section. Thereafter the materialistic ego of the gigantic form separately manifested itself, and into it entered Rudra, the controller of false ego, with his own partial activities, by which the living entity transacts his objective actions. So there you go, devotees. Those are the verses and of the section, second section, verse 11 to 25, Maitreya explains how the Lord took the forms of the demigods. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Kijai.